So we have a panel of three people who are expert in current health care policy, uh, one of the most important issues in the United States, uh, as we contemplate how quality care will be delivered to our large population, which is unserved in large part. Uh, Ed Hughes, uh, seated behind me, uh, is the head of the health care policy enterprise at Northwestern. He's going to kick it off. I'm not sure who's going next. Uh, Lee Francis, I mentioned this earlier, but think about it, runs a community health service that has over 70,000 patients plus another 12, 15,000 dental patients, uh, which is on the advanced edge of the kind of health care delivery systems that will need to be developed to in other words, we're producing a lot more people than we're producing doctors in the conventional sense. Uh, and the distribution of healthcare services is going to change very dramatically. Lee is an example of that. I know Dr. Lawrence, who will follow him, uh, is because I heard him hold forth on that subject at the Harvard Medical School yesterday. Uh, so I think, I think this is going to be a really interesting uh, uh, group discussion for you. It will go an hour and a half. They each have 20 minutes, and then they have an hour for discussion and questions. Uh, and I think you're going to find it really interesting. Ed? Great. You. Thank you, George. Well, it's a by the way, a little applause. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be back. This is actually the third time that I'll be speaking in this room. The first was that my son, uh, my lovely wife, is here, our son. Class of Amherst 1995, and in, in uh, Parents Week in 94, we went through an exercise on access dealing with the then Hillary Clinton exercise, uh, initiative that was then underway. And then, George, it must have been the third or fourth year for the Pink Symposium. You were for, on either the first or second. Second, I okay, believe. yeah, that's right. Because I, I know it's, my roommate was then 70 years old. My Amherst roommate was actually became my closest friend, Henry Friedman in New York. He was 70 that day, and that meant we didn't have to go to New York to celebrate his birthday. We were here with you. So I figured he's now 78. So, so we. Sort of nice at the third one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that would make sense, yeah. So we then we, uh, went back at that particular time. So it's really a joy to be here again. And um, I really think the whole. I teach leadership in addition to health policy and biotechnology at, uh, at Northwestern. And uh, I thought the whole theme about career development and career changes uh, of this, this uh, symposium, additional health policy, was really so much on the money. Uh, I was actually a philosophy major in Amherst, uh, pre-med, as it were, bound from medical school. But never in a million years did I think I would end up being a tenured professor in business school, in fact, one of the better business schools in the world. And I'm sure David Lawrence, who was really a dear friend, well, at Amherst, had no idea or the thought as of leaving that you'd be CEO of one of the greatest health organizations in the world, Kaiser Permanente. So it's really exciting, and I think Jerry, you and Professor Goldsby's session, You Can't Tell the Future, uh, is wonderful because everything that, ha there's so many things that can happen to you out there, be whether it's going from an English major to biology, or whatever, or reverse, it's fantastic. So what I wanted, I, in reflecting on how I could give value to you today, uh, George said we could talk about uh, access. Uh, he thought it would probably be a theme. That's certainly with Obamacare. It's, it's been on the front burner. But there's another thing that's been another health policy issue that has been critically important over my career, my life. And I would think will you determine largely the health system that you're going to be working in or otherwise uh, be involved in, um, uh, which is basically the issue of costs. And the relevance of it is hits home in the sense that I picked up the Amherst bullet uh, this morning and the first, let's say the second, first paragraph on the first page, rising health costs hurting Jones Library. Who the hell would ever thought that would make the paper, let alone, <laughs> and here it is, rising health care costs for employees is it prompting Jones Library trustees, by the place I never got to except when we voted there once, in the great civil rights movement we were involved in at the time. Uh, to recommending using more of the Jones endowment and to anticipate an increase in fundraising to avoid staff layoffs and reduce staff services next fiscal year. Okay. So uh, hit, there it is, l hitting locally. And then today's New York Times, the uh, Senate vote, I think it was 50-something or other to 41, uh, 
a gentleman named uh, Azar to be the new uh, head of Health and Human Services. That, and the lead article, after questions are rising drug prices, Senate confirms pick the health department. Uh, central to this whole issue is rising particularly pharmaceutical costs, but costs overall. By the way, George had said that we had 20 minutes and a, a big, good, honest citizen. I had set my watch to start timing me, and I forgot. So I'm going to be 23 or 4 minutes. So uh, <laughs> you're here. <laughs> but before I begin, I wanted to say, oh, it's one of the oldest tricks in the world. You know, what the hell? No, no, no. No, no. It's into the discussion. The discussion will be shorter. Anyway, but I talk fast, so don't worry about it. Now, but after, before I begin, how many of you are uh, intent on a, or thinking about a career in um, uh, biosciences as a scientist? How many, raise your hand. All right, not that many of you. How many of you are thinking of a career as a physician? It's not, it's not uh, antithetical, the first one. In other words, pre-med, terrific. Uh, how many of you are humanities majors? Good for you, three of you. Any ec economics majors here? <laughs> All right. Any of the faculty? How many of you are in biosciences? Any how many faculty are here? Good. And what are you, what's your field? I'm the science librarian. Sir? I'm uh, physics, and I'm the chair of biochemistry biosystems. Terrific. Great. <laughs> Any humanities faculty members here? They should be here. They need it. <laughs> now. Uh, well, now, uh, before I go on to cost, I want to just, I was thinking, again, value added to you. Some of the things I've learned from a career in a business school since, or just living since graduation, they're relevant to your careers and to the topic of, uh, on hand. The first is ideas, oh, by the way, a little disclaimer for my high-tech uh, uh, <laughs> materials. Uh, by the grace of God, Davis was actually able to catch uh, Antiques Roadshow when they came through recently. Uh, and I'm sure a number of you were thinking, George is a class of 1962. What do you, we thought it was not, 1962. He was 1862. He's the last uh, surviving uh, Civil War veteran. But anyway, further, being a humble professor from Midwestern school, we're a little slower out there. You know what I mean? So, uh, George, that's very funny in the Midwest. But anyway, uh, I, so the question is, ideas matter, okay? Those, if those, if those who are in science will find that out. Those who are in corporations, those who are in any not-for-profit organizations, be it yours. It's those with the ideas that will create the future, that will create innovation, that make the difference between success and non-success. Hugely important. And relevant to ideas is the fact that knowledge is not a free good. Knowledge is not a free good. And but that's why Amherst College exists, let alone other institutions of higher education. Knowledge is not a free good. It's not easy to come by. And I will postulate in the area of costs, there's very poor understanding of what's going on in healthcare and why costs are going up and what we are getting for our money. Okay. A critical question. And particularly within the field of knowledge and ideas, what really matters is understanding causal reasons. What's causing things to happen, particularly in healthcare costs? Why are they going up? What's driving them? And there's an absolutely wonderful aphorism I learned from one of my uh, evaluation research fellows when I was running the university's Health Service Research Center, and that is for want of understanding of causes, operations fail. If you don't know why something is happening, the ability to intervene successfully and with a positive outcome is very reduced. But basically, policy analysis is the, or strategic, is the identical process of a differential diagnosis in medicine. Same thought process. What is going on? What can we understand as the root cause of disease and how can we intervene therapeutically to bring about a positive outcome? If you don't have an accurate diagnosis, the ability to intervene therapeutically positively is greatly reduced. So I want to now focus on the cost, uh, on the issue of costs. And what I'm going to do, by the way, I, I mentioned I was a philosophy major while I was a pre-med, but I probably I'm the only pre-medical student in the history of Amherst College to drop out of a fine arts course to raise his average. Now, <laughs> and what, what I would like to do is draw a diagram that uh, looks something like this. 
And by the way, these are supposed to be straight lines. If you wonder why I'm not doing surgery, I trained in surgery, by the way. Uh, I told you, you'll understand why. Now, this graph shows the percent of GDP uh, going to healthcare. On that axis, here is time. We're going to start at 65, a very critical year uh, when Medicare was passed and by Congress and implemented July 1st, 66, which is the day I started my internship in surgery at Columbia. A day, it was just like being born on the 4th of July. It was a new world. And I've lived through that new world and the remarkable achievements in it, absolutely incredible. But I was there on the day of the creation. And at that time, healthcare spending might have been 6.2, 6. Point something of GDP. Well, let's, let's get this axis up. This is 70, perhaps 80, good guess would come 90, then 00, uh, 10, and then 20. So what does the curve look like? It looks roughly like this. Uh, very steep slope. You get a bump down here with Nixon's price controls in 73 or so. You get another dip down here in 86 with a DRG. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. I just want you to know I know what it is. Now, uh, <laughs> we then go to about 92, and then the uh, Journal of Health Affairs, the premier health, uh, health policy journal in the country, ran an article uh, every January. I have this January's article somewhere on the table here. Uh, on healthcare costs and spending. In those days, they would predict what it was going to be. It was 13.2% of GDP. And it was predicted it was going to go like this, up to 17% by the year 00. And lo and behold, that didn't quite happen. What happened was the deadline suddenly inflected. And gradually, as you got to the late 90s, the rate of increase was virtually zero in the private sector. And then it rose a little bit higher in the Medicaid, where Medicaid had the lowest rates of increase ever. And then we got into the late, uh, the aughts, or the early aughts, as it were, and then this, this started to happen again. What we had a kind of, dip, uh, in the Great Recession, we had a dip down to a lower rate. And then we started going up again. Obamacare came in, we had a spurt, and then it's kind of leveled back off now, about 4.3% increase last year. So the interesting question, or this graph raises a couple of questions. One is, what's going on here? Why is that line going up? The second question is, what's this? Why did that flattening take place? The third is, what's going on now? And then the fourth is, what happens out here during your careers? And so, I thought that I, we would start off by addressing question number one. And uh, I've done this exercise with many groups across the country. And years ago, I developed a list of 10 reasons, long before David Letterman was a household word. Many of you now have probably never heard of him. But anyway, uh, uh, I came up with 10. And then I just aggregated one of them because it had two really components. So I came up with uh, 11. And then as I went around the country giving speeches, a, a 12 would come up periodically. And I would make note of it, we'd write it down. And then I gave a speech at the Harvard Club in Commonwealth Avenue a number of years ago, and it was mentioned. So when, uh, deference to the Harvard Club is now formally on the list. Now, yeah, this is very funny stuff. Come on. <laughs> no. You ever been to the Harvard Club? Kind of a stuffy place. You ever been to the Harvard Faculty Club? No. Bunch of weirdos. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> now, uh, anyway, so the critical questions are, why is that line going up? What are those 10 reasons? The list, by the way, is not arranged uh, quantitatively. So eight is not necessarily more powerful than nine or than seven or whatever. But why is it going up? Ideas? This is an interactive session. Almost. Yes? Increased cost of technology? Yes, good for you. And by the way, that is uh, what I write down as number one. And by this, when you say technology, what do you mean? You're absolutely right. My bias is that that is the biggie. What, do you, what does technology mean to you? What's? Imaging systems, computer systems. Correct. Uh, let alone things like renal dialysis, you mentioned it. As a medical student at Harvard, second year, I interviewed the only dialysis patient in the world. Dialysis did not become promulgated to the Congressional Acts of 1972, okay? We don't even think about that, let alone transplantation, okay? It was crazy. If you said a liver, uh, we had a guy at Harvard trying to uh, uh, transplant livers, uh, you thought he was crazy. To think that a liver could be transplanted was beyond the realm of human reasonableness. You said it will, within 10 or 15 years it will be done. It was a one-way ticket to mass mental health. It's crazy. Okay. Let alone heart transplants. <laughs> Let alone heart transplants. 
Uh, John Jack Bogle. Anyone know who Jack Bogle is? You know George. You must be close to him. Anyone know who he is? He's tell him who he is. Tell who Bogle is. He's head. Okay. He's head of. He started Vanguard Funds. All right. He was on CNBC a couple of years ago. And they said, "How you doing?" I'm terrific. He's about 83 or 84. He's terrific. And he goes through. This is good. And the market's doing this and that. And I'm about ready to have my 10th uh, cardiac anniversary. And they said, what? I said, yeah, I'm going to meet in Philadelphia with a cardiac surgeon and my cardiologist. They're selling my 10th year following a heart transplant. Wow. I mean, these are miracles. These did not exist when I was here with you at, at Amherst. This, these did not exist. And it's important to contemplate what we have done, let alone the current PD-1 inhibitors and CAR T cells, all of that stuff, okay, creating a new world of medicine that you will enjoy. And by the way, uh, the, for all of the problems with health care costs, uh, the Congress is increasing the spending and, and support for NIH. I was talking to my wife earlier today. She said how Republicans are afraid of dying. <coughs> they don't know where they might go. And therefore, they want NIH to uh, uh, be supported to live as long as they can. Now, what else we got on that list? Yes. The baby boomers? Pardon me? The baby boomers? Yes. What about them? <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead. They're getting older, so they're as, as people get older, they need medical care. That's absolutely right. Demographics. They're eating too much. You know that? Well, everybody's doing that. But I mean, uh, they're living longer. They're living longer because of medical care okay, to consume more medical care. It's not brand for breakfast that's doing this. Okay? What's fascinating is the that the United States had, if you get to 80, George, there's hope out there. You get to 80, you, the United States is the second longest longevity in the world. Second longest longevity. What might have the first longevity over? Japan. Japan's a great guess. They have the, the highest sure. average age, but not the longest over 80. Anyone know that? Sweden. It's Iceland. Oh. It's Iceland. Shows the pace be frozen all the time, but pickled half the time, you'll live forever. <laughs> but they, uh, they are growing. This is a huge. By the way, the United States population grew by 0.07% last year. The natural increase plus immigration exceeds our death rate. This is absolutely correct. And as these people age be, and save by technology, they're consuming more of it. Okay. What else? Yes, sir. Bureaucracy. Yes. Beautiful. Uh, we'll put that in, we call it regulation. Physicians are required to use an electronic health record, okay, no matter how small your practice. Some of my former students, actually I have a lot of work study students undergraduates, who want to go to medical school, but take a gap year. They'll take courses, and they become scribes. What scribe is? Lee, what's a scribe? Uh, I think you have a papyrus and uh... <laughs> 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 you go like that. I got you. Do. I don't even know what's a scribe. I never heard of it. It's a new job category. Uh, like, sorry, uh, people just write down everything that the doctor does. Doctor does, okay, and they then enter it into the computer after the rounds, etc. Okay, if the mm -hmm. physician is not working till nine o'clock at night at home putting the stuff in, okay, deleting two articles in. Uh, this week's in the of Medicine, physician burnout, okay. in large part because of this kind of regulation. Huge issue. There's a zillion ways that this has caused healthcare costs to rise. What else? Yes, sir. Obesity. Yes. And I, I will put obesity in a broader category. I'll put it here at number eight. I call it epidemiologic vagaries. And by epidemiologic vagaries, I mean changing patterns of diseases. I spent a year at the School of Public Health. Epidemiology is basically the study of changing patterns of diseases. And by the way, it's a wonderful word. It's a wonderful word. If you go to a cocktail party setting, you know, I just say, epidemiologically speaking, people are very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> now, obesity is one of those things, OK? Uh, you have uh, the flu epidemic right now, <clears throat> a shortage of your thing. But I wrote down at least six or eight uh, other things. Uh, by the way, the mayor, the, the um, Governor of Maine wanted to restrict food stamps from buying uh, sodas and candy because 30% of the population of Maine is obese. Okay. But there's another article recently in the New York Times about New Hampshire, that's Sunday's article, about Peterborough. 
10% uh, of the population of New Hampshire is addicted to what? Opioids. Okay, alcohol or opioids. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge epidemic. Over 800,000 deaths last year. The, and the tragedy, the opiate thing is, you, he goes to the emergency, overdose by the emergency room, they shoot him up, he goes back home, two hours later, he's back again. Okay? Driving up costs. It would almost, it was like mass USA. If it weren't so tragic, it would be funny. You know, well, you're back again, Charlie. Yep, here we go. Out he goes, back again. Anyway, what else? Yes. By the way, shout them out. What? Big farm. Big those bad guys. They're, bad. <laughs> they're, they're under technology. They only invest somewhere around 50 billion a year in research, but that's about where they are. Yeah. Uh, how else? Specialization, Ed. Yes. Complexity and yes. specialization. Yes. Beautiful, David. Beautiful. But he was an excellent student, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, has lost his touch. That's number 10. Specialization. <laughs> and and uh, I, uh, 12. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, when I was in medical school, nobody went to gastroenterology. Nobody. If they had no technology, and most people study stuff in the body, and go in and they study stuff coming up. Not good at all. And uh, 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 the only technology was a stiff rod. Look, kind of look down, see what's going on. We actually tried to do that in the medical school. Two years after I'm out of medical school, fiber optics comes along, a little open anesthesia, down it goes, gastroscopy. Uh, it goes from the 19th most frequent procedure under Medicare to number two, okay, behind cataract extraction. Do you know what a gastroenterologist, about like everybody goes into the special, everybody. Do you know what they're looking at when they see the gastroscope? You know what they're looking at down there? You know what's down there? They do what's down there? It's a dollar sign right down there. That's what they're looking at. And uh, so over specialization. Uh, we had an episode where a family member was told by a primary care physician that um, uh, she had earwax and she needed to get it taken out by an ENT. So we go to see an ENT guy. One guy's a sinusitis guy. Okay, so we go to somebody else, he's a laryngology guy. No one takes the earwax out anymore, you know? It's crazy. So uh, what else is going on? Well, that's number one. That would be under technology. That would be included under technology. Yes? Reliance on emergency medical services? Yes, yes. That's interesting. That's a left wing, uh, not a left wing, but a left uh, uh, curveball way of getting uh, at that issue. Let me just give you number four on here would be uh, efforts to increase access. And there are, there are many of those. I mean, the first off, the growth of private health insurance, starting in the, with the Baylor plan in 1929 in uh, Texas. And then the same year, by the way, they, the first managed care organization, Ross Lewis in Los Angeles. But uh, private health insurance, then public health insurance, be it Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and then, basically, you had CHIP program in the news the last couple, week or so. Obamacare, on and on and on. The renal dialysis program. All of these things have contributed to costs going up. I think the, the uh, emergency room thing was a, felt to be a lack of universal coverage causing people to, you know, with a, as extremists go to the emergency room. So that would be part of it, yes. That would be part of it. Uh, and attempts to remedy that problem through these efforts have been driving up costs. What else? Yes, sir. Uh, this may go under technology, but there are a lot of diseases that used to be fatal that are now chronic and require constant uh, medication. Yes, yeah, so we will, the, yes, that would be under here, under demographics, and this basically the success of medicine. Heart, de, it's, it's a coronary uh, artery fatalities, you know, heart disease, death rates in the United States have fallen 80% over the last, since 1967, when I was a medical student, saw the, the first, really, uh, cardiac monitoring being disseminated around. I mean, it's just, it's amazing, the extent of open, different types of procedures. That's a huge winner. And all these people, Bob, Bob George, and, and David, that's why people come back to reunions. They're alive, you know? <laughs> Seriously, think about that, you know? My father's generation, they were dropping off in their 40s on a regular, every year, there was a weird place to get hard, but now every year, one less guy coming down. What else? Yes, sir? Uh, could you say insurance premiums? Well, that would be, yeah, yes, that would be here. Then the question is, are they rising beyond inappropriate levels, et cetera? But that would be in the efforts to increase access. Yes? Malpractice. Absolutely. 
Where's, where's Davis? Take that guy's name. He's getting an A. He's doing really good. Uh, two of them. At medical liability. We, uh, this is a serious, serious problem. There's not a physician in the United States you don't talk to who's not going to tell you that this changes their behavior. Inappropriate, excess testing, on and on and on and on. A serious, serious problem. It also has a lot to do with specialties physicians go into, uh, where they locate in Illinois. There are no f obstetricians along the eastern border of Illinois. <laughs> Oops, my goodness. Gosh. Uh -oh. uh, some aberrant number, I don't know why that happened, but anyway. Uh, uh, there, are no, there are no physicians along the border of Illinois. They're all in Indiana. There are no neurosurgeons in southern Illinois because of the high malpractice. This is a serious, serious issue. Just quickly, and then I actually have all 12 of them on here, and we can, um, uh, I can wrap up in a few, few minutes. Any others? Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry. Education. What? Education. Yes, that's the 12th. Increased knowledge. People know there are benefits from this service now. We want more of it. We want more. And it goes, correlates with income rising, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, any other quickies? Yes, sir. Ms. Judy? What about end of life care? Maybe that's beautiful. Works. Absolutely beautiful. Kind the of fallacy of health insurance. Uh, <laughs> no, I knew that's exactly what you meant to say. <laughs> but uh, it, 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 we, insurance is a vehicle to protect individuals against low probability events over which they have no control. And um, uh, we're insuring against a certainty, which is death. It's absurd. It's absurd. Right? And we now have means to prolong that death in ways sometimes that are not very cost effective. Thank God for hospice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a major issue. Just quickly, uh, now uh, under epidemiologic vagaries, this is um, excess institutional capacity. Hospitals growing faster than they should be. Managed care has done a lot to, to um, uh, correct that. Also, uh, when you had increased specialization, uh, well, I'm off. This should be up here. Uh, it's basically it's suboptimal decision making. <coughs> Managed care has done a lot with algorithms, uh, etc., to make better decisions. Etc. What might be two? two? Two is always the last one given, and then we'll wrap up. What's two? What's two? If you got uh, increased technology, you mentioned imaging and all that kind of stuff in hospitals. What else you got to have? By the genetic testing, by the way, is under here. Oh, you have to have. You have to take care of those machines. Yes. So maintenance, absolutely. Yes. But what else? False positives? No. Nope. People are Who said that? Right there, okay? You need people to run them. You need a higher, as Peter Drack would say, you need an educated workforce, okay? A knowledge industry. You now have people with, with advanced degrees running these imaging and all that kind of stuff. It's all these people are, are have at a minimum a bachelor's degree, et cetera. So it's health professional shortages. The average nurse in this country is somewhere in the late 40s, if not 50s. Uh, we really, in, uh, we've got laboratory technology shortages. Uh, radiology technology shortages, dietitian shortages, physical therapy shortages. How do you cure labor shortage in labor markets? Increase. Raise wages. Okay. And how are you going to do that with all the pressures being put on regulation, etc.? <coughs> so basically, uh, those are the drivers. And here is the what what. So this is number one, the reason for one. Two is managed care. This flattened it out by getting rid of a number of the high techs in, in, in high technology by dealing with the uh, excess, um, excuse me, uh, institutional capacity, dealing some with specialization, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is, then it got out the easy stuff, okay? But there's a basic line of consumption of medical care, which after the easy stuff, just basically hit this line and it's basically driven it up. Okay? You had a slight fall in the Great Recession. Obamacare drove spending up 5.9, 5.4% in 13 to 14. We're at 4.3% now. So the question is, what happens here? And this is your generation. You got basically, do, you, do, the, do the people who don't understand why costs are rising, how many of these are intervenable? Is demographic intervenable, et cetera, et cetera? No. These are social policies driving this kind of stuff. Uh, social, so uh, are we going to try to keep it like this? There are those who think we could do that. They were living in fantasy land. So the question is, what is the right slope? And we, many, David's organization and others, are working to keep that line at the absolute minimum rate of increase. But this is critical. 
This is social choice. And your generation will have to make that decision. What is it going to be the slope of that line? And my bias is this industry needs more investment, needs more social resources, not less, because we're getting our money's worth. And the future is incredibly exciting that you're going to be living through. But you cannot deal with this issue without understanding why costs are rising. Because for lack of understanding causes, operations fail. It's complex. It's not a problem. It's a dilemma. There's no solution. You have to manage it on an ongoing basis, but you will have a very exciting time doing that managing on an ongoing basis. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, all I can say is, uh-oh, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> Pressure's on. Uh, if I tell as many jokes as Ed did, uh, I will have a very long talk, and uh, we'll never get to Dr. Lawrence, so I'm very sensitive to that. And I did detect a general theme, though, and that is we are progressing from the organ and cellular level up to the population level, so that's where I hope to take us here. And so thank you for uh, stopping in between. And I uh, was thinking back as I as we look at my objectives for what I'd like to talk about today, first of all, the title of what I want to talk about is a well-kept secret, which is, you know, Ed's talking about there's systems out there that we're funding, so any money that you save, Ed, I'm going to spend right now. That there's systems of health care, and, and we don't know about them. Average person out there doesn't know about them. I want to spend some time talking about that today, and I'm going to be talking about the system of community health centers. Uh, but before I do, I was reflecting uh, on the real name of this room, which is the Red Room, which is a confusing name. I'm not sure why it's called the Red Room, but well, even yeah, <laughs> even 35 years ago when <laughs> even 35 years ago when I was here, and I sat in that chair where the gentleman in the gray sweater is sitting uh, for uh, Russian 11, which was Stanley Rabinowitz's class. Stanley still. Professor here, did he yes. time? Yeah, and uh, he would know everyone's name in the class. And uh, uh, Lee Francis, you're from, uh, you, you grew up in Hinsdale, Illinois. You went to Hinsdale Central High School, and you're on the swimming team. Okay. Well, how did he know that? I have no idea. But um, that's a fond memory of this room, and also a fond memory was from chemistry um, and talking about MRIs and these amazing images. Um, I uh, had the pleasure of studying under Ruth Stark, who was um, the first female chemistry professor at Amherst College. And uh, she had this thing called an MRI machine, and we used to put test tubes in it and make MRI graphs of flipping the protons and stuff like that. And she said, one day there's going to be pictures from this thing, and uh, it won't be long. It's just the computers, and she was right. Uh, my objectives are I want to introduce one community health center to you, mine in Chicago, Illinois. I want to then talk about the characteristics of community health centers as a system of health care and stress the models that make it a great model of health care, particularly for underserved communities and low-income communities. And then I'd like to just touch a little bit about the interaction between the Affordable Care Act, because it's still the law of the land, and uh, community health the way we know it today, and just describe that interaction a little bit. And I would love to spend a whole week here at Amherst College talking about this thing, but I only have 15, 20 minutes. So first of all, to the geography of Chicago, uh, on the shores of Lake Chicago, which my friend Hillary from New York City, class of 83, said, what's the name of that lake that Chicago's on? Isn't it Lake Chicago? We actually had to go to the library and look it up in an atlas so I could prove to Hillary, who's now a radiologist in New York, uh, that it's called Lake Michigan. But um, <laughs> like community. By the way, you're right about that. They I am right. About what's out there. Yeah. <laughs> Everything after the Hudson River, gone. <laughs> uh, community health centers, these are the uh, service sites of Erie Family Health Center, which started on Erie Street in Chicago 60 years ago. And uh, the thing about community health centers is that they are located in the neighborhoods where the need is, and they're uh, designed to respond to the needs of the particular communities. So you've seen one community health center, you've seen one, but they do exist all the way across the country. Ours in particular, and you could see this picture from 1957, 60 years ago, um, were 501c3, all of us, nonprofit organizations, were independent, but we qualify as federally qualified health centers to get some federal dollars 
to help offset some of the costs for the comprehensive models that we provide, especially to uninsured and low-income patients. And as was mentioned earlier, 72,000 patients, which I think of as a NFL stadium full of patients, but full of people, uh, some of them screaming wildly on a, on a, on a warm summer uh, fall afternoon. But the thing that sets community health centers apart, perhaps from the entire healthcare industry, is the mission. And the mission of our health center below has several key words, like healthcare is a right, which goes back to the civil rights movement in the 1960s. It's not a privilege. Uh, we have a mission, and it's accessible, meaning you can get in. Affordable, meaning you can pay. And if you can't pay, you can still get it. And it's of high quality, which means, uh, uh, we're a health center, not a clinic. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. A clinic, I think of, uh, there's a rusty chair, you take a number, you may or may not be seen that day by someone who may or may not be qualified. So the experience should be of top quality. You should wanna bring your mom, your grandma, your sister, your own self, your kids, to the very community-based services that are designed to serve all people, regardless of the ability to pay. Now, I'm going to project on the screen here a map of Canada. <laughs> oh, just kidding. Uh, but Canadians might be familiar with something like this. This is a network of community health centers across the United States. And when I say it's a system of health care that's largely unknown, I, I propose to you that covering 26 million people at health centers around the country. Like my health center would be one dot on the map over here on the shores of Lake Chicago. But a system that 26 million people is not a small number. And so it should be an influential number. But the problem is the 26 million could be some of the most disenfranchised people in the United States whose voices are not often heard. And so when you think about what's going on in Washington, D.C. right now, I want to just say that on September 30th, national funding of last year, 2017, national funding for all community health centers ran out, completely ran out. Now there's still some fumes left in the tank, so there's not too, a major panic yet, but in another month there's going to be a huge panic, and there's continuing resolutions, and we don't have a budget, and we hear chip pass, that's great, but every time Congress doesn't act, it does affect, can affect millions and millions of people. What I want to point out is you just, those of you in the back rows, if you just squint your eyes, you can see some amazing stories about the United States of America and healthcare. Over here, we pick apples and pears in the fall. Over here come the strawberries uh, and the fruits and vegetables that you eat in Valentine. And over here come the pineapples. And over here was the great, uh, effort in terms of the 1960s and the civil rights movement, very poor rural south and a great migration to the north. Over here is Appalachia. Over here are ports of entry into the United States. So these community health centers really do mirror. Now if anyone where the need is, if, now if you're from Nebraska, you wonder why there's no dot there, that's because there's some counties in Nebraska where there are less people in the whole county that live in the town of Amherst. So I mentioned the history of civil rights movement being the roots of community health centers. And the first one really cropped up with federal support in Mound Bayou, Mississippi. By 1967, it was ready to get up and running in this area of Miss Mississippi, described in this wonderful book. And uh, there was another first one uh, because politics is politics and all politics is local. It was in the north, it was in Boston. So there were two, two first community health centers. And if you were to tour the rural south in the 1960s, it would look like a, uh, it was a developing country. And uh, the diseases that were seen uh, were malnutrition for one, kwashiorkor and things like that that you would never think to be seen in the United States of America. And so health was thought to be a right and still is. Now, what's important to understand is that there may be lots of need out there across the United States, but as pointed out, uh, and I put up a map here of the health profession shortage areas across the United States, 
there are a lack of health professions. This is for physicians and primary care providers. But they mirror, and you would have to blow up some of the urban areas to see this, but you can see that these are areas where um, clinicians are needed. And in fact, most community health centers qualify as health profession shortage areas. And there's a thing called the National Health Service Corps where if you serve a year, you get your loans from medical school or professional school, nursing school repaid for a year. Two years, you get two years repaid. They still have to pay you your salary, too. They can't take that out of your salary. So it's a great program. That also expired at the end of September. So there's a lot of doctors in service around the United States. And another characteristic about community health centers is that who's the boss of me? I'm the CEO of a community health center, so I actually might think, you might think I don't have a boss, but I actually do have a boss, and that's a very powerful thing because uh, what happened is the models that govern community health centers, some of them were imported from South Africa. Uh, Sydney uh, Kark uh, in the 1960s showed in South Africa that if you design health services to meet the needs of the community, you can impact the health of the community. And if you let the health centers in South Africa be governed by including some people who are patients of the health center on the governing board, my boss, then um, the people who run the health centers will actually listen to them and continue to design the services to what's needed in the community. And so that's what happened in the United States with the design of the community health center movement. It's a requirement that more than half of the governing boards of community health centers must be patients of the health center. So you can imagine as these boards meet at 1,300 community health centers across the country once a month, the voice of patients is being heard. And that's really important because um, out there, there are a lot of clinic visits being done every year. There's a lot of physicians, full-time equivalents, that's whole bodies, physicians, Nurse practitioners, physician assistants, certified nurse midwives, dentists and dental hygienists and mental health staff out there deployed to meet the needs of the community. But the, the um, voice of the patient is very important and it, the quality of care is paramount such that um, if you were to take basic measures in community health and if you were to pay attention to these basic numbers, you would start to realize that none of these numbers can be completely influenced by a face-to-face -face visit with a clinician within four walls. And so in order to hold down costs and to be more efficient, I think Ed might be the first person to say that it would be a good idea that we start to influence patients by what happens in between their visits to our health facilities as much or more than we influence them at a facility. So take, for example, diabetes control. This is our health center. This is the state average and the national average. So of course, we're better, of course. One is, uh, green is good, we're better. But anyway, the point is, in order to influence diabetes, we have to address the social components of diabetes, which don't happen in 15 minutes in a doctor's office. And so in order to be successful, we have to design plans and interventions for what happens between. Dr. Vizet calculated it, and it is 0.0004% of a diabetic's life that is spent in front of a cl clinician. The rest, 99.9996, whatever it is, is spent doing whatever we do in our lives. So that brings me to something that I think is important to understand system of healthcare. You have to know how prevalent the use of that system is and how you can increase the use. So I took a look at Western Mass the other day. Uh, we're over here. And these are community health centers, administrative sites of health centers, homeless <laughs> health centers, and health centers and shelters in Massachusetts. And this shows the, per the darker the green, the higher percent of patients in that zip code who are low income who go to a health center for their care. They could go anywhere else, maybe, maybe they can't, but they go to a health center for care. And it strikes me as a public health person that anytime you get 20 to 40 percent of something happening in an area, that is very significant. So here's Western Mass. 
Uh, here's Boston area up close where <coughs> community health centers are the place to go in certain neighborhoods of the United States. And this is true in California, the Bay Area, ports of entry to the country where your lettuce and tomatoes and strawberries come from, migrant workers in the Central Valley of California, for example. And I could show Denver, I could show Tampa, I could show San Antonio, I could show almost any region of the country and you would see the same thing. In the system of healthcare where some 20, I don't know any other health systems that have 20% of the market. The problem is it's 20% of the low income uh, market. So that's not a competitive market so much, even with Obamacare. Now, I'm gonna be best friends with Ed at dinner tonight because I wanna show that cost is an issue, that cost is important, and I wanna show that health centers are a good deal across the country, that they're cost effective. Because if you don't have a cost effective, uh, deployment, you don't have a good system of health care. So the top line is what the federal government spent each year to grant out to health centers across the country. It's about 18% of the total amount that health centers spent. And isn't that funny how this always happens? The federal government spends a paltry amount, $4.3 billion on health centers. Uh, health centers spend a total of $23 billion on health care <laughs> for all that they do, that's the lights, the salaries, the supplies, flushing the toilet, anything you think can happen. And if you take this number divided by this number, you come up with it costs about $900 to provide a complete year of primary and preventive care to a patient at a community health center. So I'll leave it to you, is that a good deal or not a good deal? Some people's health premiums on their insurance are $800 a month, but full disclosure, that doesn't co cover the CT scan in the hospital and the open heart surgery and uh, something that might happen in the hospital. But if you just take the community health center deployment for primary care, some would say that's a pretty good deal. I think it is. Uh, the federal part of that is $166 per patient. And if you, that's why health centers are popular on both sides of the aisle, red and blue. And uh, that's why, um, that's why uh, we are able to provide such a volume of care to uninsured patients at community health centers. Even with Obamacare, there's a lot of uninsured still in the country. It's uh, concentrated amongst immigrant populations in low-income areas. And the rich patients have Medicaid now and not too much Medicare out there in the community health centers, but getting uh, bigger as we go along. And for those that are low income, which low income is federal poverty level is $23,000 for a family of four, which I spent at Trader Joe's the other day, just on one visit. And 200% of the federal poverty level for a family of four is $46,000. Most health centers around the country, light blue and dark blue, uh, 90 some percent of the patients, over 90 percent, are living at twice the federal poverty level or below. This is extremely low income. Twice the federal poverty level is very low income. And uh, that is why health centers provide sliding fees for patients who don't have insurance, who are at twice the federal poverty level or below. For example, at our place, $35 for your visit. If you pay today, $25. Because uh, some people don't want to pay, because, but I think the people feel responsible for their care and want to own it and pay something. If you need to come back within 30 days, $20, because maybe you have a, asthma is not fully taken care of, your diabetes is out of control, and if you pay that day, 15 whereas Medicaid and Medicare pay higher, again, are rich payers. So this is where that, those federal dollars come in to help make up the gap there. Of course, we raise money, too. We write other grants. I do a lot of philanthropic work. I haven't quite gotten to the point of Biddy and the amount of money she raises for the college endowment, but I would love to some someday. So I'd like to conclude by just tying it back to something that some, what Ed said, and he mentioned the Affordable Care Act. And um, it's still the law of the land, and it was signed by President Obama in 2010, passed by a Democratic majority uh, back in those days. 
Uh, Medicaid, which is health insurance for lower income Americans, expanded uh, by approximately 10 million, give or take. I know, you know, we're gonna get, I'm gonna get corrected that by Kaiser coming in a minute, but the marketplace, which is going online and buying health insurance, if you're too rich for Medicaid, was about 10 million people. And even with that, 15 to 20 remain uninsured. And it just came out last week that the first data that shows that the uninsured rate had been going down, 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 and for the first time it bumped up again uh, a couple weeks ago, the first data came, came out. And health centers, I told you, already have a capacity of 26 million. And, you know, health centers have expanded. This is our health center, but reflective across the United States. During Bush II, we doubled the number of patients. Again, red, good, cost-effective, high-quality. Uh, blue, also good, expanded much faster under the Affordable Care Act, but this is true across the United States. So just to show you that um, public health is good policy, it doesn't matter if it's red or blue. But ultimately, um, you know, having been a chemistry major and getting into some Latin American studies, as a, which helped me in my career because 80% um, of our patients speak Spanish at our health centers, so that came in handy. Um, it, it helped me understand um, bringing my analytical self with my social self. And I came up with this very um, important equation. And um, I was later told that it's a tautology <laughs> by some philosopher. And uh, that, that um, despite Obamacare and what we know about health insurance, if you have an insurance card in your pocket, it's a, it's a, this is my hotel room card, it's not an insurance card. But let's just say it was, it's just an insurance card unless you have, if you're low income and you're given insurance or allowed to apply for it, unless you have access to health care and it's a quality product and you, and you feel comfortable and it's culturally competent, you feel comfortable going there and respected, then it's just a piece of plastic. So it doesn't really matter how many people have insurance unless they can use it. And it wouldn't be Amherst College and something that have to do with statistics if I didn't show a four box table with some equilibrium signs in between in case you studied chemistry. And so I really feel like we're here in the community health world and maybe in the United States of America that we kind of expanded the insured pretty significantly and we did some expansion of community uh, capacity, that would have been the best case scenario, but we kind of got stuck part way and we're kind of halfway in this world here where we expanded the insured but not quite expanded community capacity including, including workforce. And down here are some of these unsustainable where you don't expand the insured but you build lots of new places who would do that and or you have no expansion of the insured and you have no expansion of community capacity which is where we were in the 1960s. So with that, I wanted to thank you, thank the conveners. I wanted to thank uh, those of you who gave your attention to a problem that's still not solved. And um, gracias por confiar su salud a Erie. And aquí todos siempre serán bienvenidos. Everyone will always be welcome. And I look forward to the panel discussion. Well, thank you. It, I'm Dave Lawrence, and it's a pleasure to be back uh, speaking again to this group. Uh, I've been here a couple of times previously. Uh, the two Chicagoans were talking about how, uh, how far out to the west they feel from uh, civilization. I came to Amherst from Oregon, uh, and this is a true story. Uh, in my so freshman year, in the spring, I obtained a date with a young woman at Smith, and we were to go bicycling around a pond that apparently existed or still exists in, in uh, Northampton. And I came racing in to a bunch of my friends, and I said, I'm going biking, I'm going biking, I've got a date. And then I stopped, and I decided to have a little fun. I said, you know, I don't know how to ride a bike. I, <laughs> I rode a horse to and from school, and in addition to that, I'm half Native American. I was blonde and blue-eyed at the time, and it was not credible, but 
they believed it, my friends, <laughs> and I spent some time pretending to learn how to ride a bike so I could have this date, and I damn near killed myself falling <laughs> off that bike, faking the inability to ride the bike. I was stunned at how little people knew about what occurred west of the Hudson, and, <laughs> and so I, I sympathize with, uh, with your plight. I have no slides, I have no archaic uh, audiovisual tools. <laughs> I was a jock at Amherst, so I didn't even know how to turn on the lights. Uh, and it still applies. Let me talk about three or four things to kind of round out the conversation you've heard so far. Ed talked about rising costs, a very significant issue, and he talked about the causes of rising costs. Um, what I'd like to do is to talk about two or three other major issues that both Ed and Lee have talked about that are going to shape the future that you face uh, as you get out into your careers as scientists or as clinicians. The first of these is the unresolved issue of whether or not medical care, health care, is a privilege or a right. You heard the consequences of the fact that we have gerrymandered a loaded term, we've gerrymandered the solutions to medical care coverage in the country, but still have not resolved the issue of whether or not health care is a right or a privilege. Unfortunately, the current dialogue is talking about a solution to payment, which is the single payer system, or Medicare for all, which is one method for achieving a, a, a simpler less costly payment system than the one we have. But it is only one. And it begs the question, what is the underlying principle that needs to be addressed as a, as, as a country? It's one we have yet to address effectively. I would argue, as Duval Patrick did today, in, uh, in, uh, he was interviewed by Frank Brunei, uh, a, a uh, editorial writer for the New York Times, this morning, and he mentioned that the most critical issue is to establish that principle as an operating principle for the country. That medical, that everyone, universal health care coverage with comprehensive health care benefits that are affordable. And do away with all the debate. There are a couple reasons for that I'd like to come back to, but let me just mention the two other areas that I'd like to just uh, talk to uh, during my time. The second issue, which Lee uh, really uh, touched on, is the fact that there is a huge and growing chasm between demand for health care services and the availability of the traditional medical care models to supply it. And the third issue, which is a very positive issue to address going forward, that you all will be up to your eyeballs in, and it's going to be very, very exciting, is how to use the emerging technologies, not necessarily the bioscientific technologies, but how to join the scientific technologies that you heard about in the first two uh, presentations, for example, with the emerging enabling technologies to provide supply of critical healthcare services, telephony, the computing capabilities, the new analytic capabilities that, uh, of AI and machine learning, things of that nature. It's exploding and represents a major opportunity for us to address the supply-demand chasm that exists today. But let me start with the first, which is the principle of universal health care. Why is that important? I think there are three reasons. The first is moral. We are, as and, and have remained for many, many decades, the only advanced country that doesn't provide universal health care to its citizens. It's as simple as that. It's a moral question. It's a moral question because absent access to financing, appropriate financing for health care, begs the question of whether or not you can get it if you are financed. As Lee said, it's a, you know, an insurance card is an insurance card. But it starts with being able to afford to go and what it is that you get when you get there, what kind of coverage, what kind of uh, benefits do you have. It's a moral question because people die if they don't have it. It's as simple as that. People die if they don't have access to health care. And we are allowing, we are making conscious decisions in our country to allow people to die by not covering them. They not only don't die, or they don't live, or they die early, but they carry an excess disease burden as a consequence of not having access to appropriate health care services 
not just medical care, diagnostic, curative services, but the sorts of preventive and, and lifestyle interventions that are also included. The moral question is how long can we sustain that as a society? It's a deeply troubling question. The second issue is that it makes economic sense to provide coverage. The usual argument is it costs too much. We can't afford it. How can we pay for it? Going to increase the debt. Guess what costs a lot? Being sick. Guess what costs a lot? Excess preventable mortality and morbidity. Guess what costs, costs a lot? Employees who were more worried about their children and their dependents and how they're going to get them covered than they are about producing at the job. It's called absentism, a major problem in American industry. Think about the cost to our society of not covering people for health care. And the third reason, which I think is both a social cost and an economic cost, is think about how much it costs to maintain a society as inequitable as ours. Think about what it costs to maintain the kind of privilege that many of us enjoy and to sustain the lack of privilege that many don't. Think about the wonderful book, The New Jim Crow. Think about the problem of incarceration. Think about the problems of opiate addiction. Those are the costs of inequality. And to maintain a society that is as unequal as ours extracts an enormous cost, political cost, social cost, a sense of commitment to our community, our shared community, etc. And of course, that's what we're, much of the political de debate today in the last year focuses around those divisions, the increasing inequality amongst different groups, the privileged and the non-privileged in our society. So when you look at the issue of universal coverage with affordable, comprehensive health care, there's a critical moral issue, there's a critical economic question, and there's a critical question as well about the sustainability of a society that allows this to happen and the costs associated with that morally, socially, cohesion, and economically. We have to deal with that. That's a crucial issue. And we all are right in the middle of that soup and will be until we resolve that question. The second question that we have is one of supply and demand. Demand is exploding, as we've talked about. It's exploding demographically, as Ed showed in his, in his uh, list of 12 things. <clears throat> it's not just the numbers of people. If you look at the intermediate projections to the population by, uh, for 2050, it's going to be somewhere around 450 million people in the United States, maybe as high as 480 million people in the United States, depending on the growth rates, et cetera, and a lot, lot of assumptions go into that. But it's a huge step up from where we are now when we don't have enough physicians today. The projected gap between demand, and remember those are estimates, they can be off fairly significantly if you have ever tried to estimate uh, health care uh, demand. Um, but if you accept the, the, the estimates, the chasm between demand and supply results in a shortage by 2025 of somewhere in the nature or somewhere in the range of between 30 and 60,000 primary care physicians. The numbers of people entering medical school has increased only slightly since the mid-1980s. The numbers of people choosing primary care has dropped every year. As the specialties continue to gather more income and more prestige, and the medical schools themselves and residency programs really circulate, circulate around the prestige of the specialties and subspecialty care. Nothing has been introduced in my lifetime uh, in, in medicine that has altered that inexorable decline in the numbers of people choosing primary care. Adding to that issue is the fact that most people going into medical school are still white. 
Minority populations are affected negatively in distribution into medical schools in spite of programs to try and increase minority enrollments. And the consequence of that is that the availability of physician manpower, the cultural competence of our physician manpower, is not reflective of the diversity of the population we now serve. Lee talked about it. 80% of his population speaks Spanish. Probably less than 2 or 3% of people going into medicine have any kinds of Spanish language skills. And we know how critical cultural competence and cultural connectedness is to the healing process. So when you think about the supply-demand chasm, think about it as how in the world do we meet the demand for health care with the current or the historic models of medical care delivery that we've relied on, namely doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs. We talked about the team. We all use them. But when you add those all up, the numbers don't compute. It's a huge problem that you all will be wrestling with. And that brings me to the third. And that is, if one looks at the explosion in enabling technologies that you take for granted, let's go back a little bit, just to put it in perspective. Eddie talked about what happened when he was a, an intern with cardiac rehab and cardiac diagnostics. I always like to say my first patient that I ever had to take care of, my third year of medical school, was a patient with cardiac insufficiency. He had a mitral valve problem from rheumatic heart disease, which we almost never see anymore. And we decided, his attending decided to do an experimental procedure on him with his agreement. Cardiac catheterization. It was experimental. That was 1965, and he died on the table. Think about, as I look at, at, the, at the trajectory that medicine has taken over the years uh, since Ed and I went to medical school, it's simply breathtaking. Computers didn't exist. Personal and computers didn't exist in widespread use until the 1980s. Cell phones, smart cell phones, were introduced after about 1995 to 2000. I mean, think about these enabling technologies that we now take for granted. They represent an infrastructure that can be tapped for the delivery of certain services in healthcare that enable us to use the doctors appropriately for the only things that doctors can do. We can use technologies, for example, to do the transition from being independent. Lee talked about a very important figure. We, I, I, Put it a little bit differently, when you think about how often a patient with type 2 diabetes sees his or her physician in a year, a typical doctor visit is about 10 minutes, maybe 15, and you will see your doctor probably four times in a year. Right? Is that about right? Maybe six. Okay, let's say six. Let's be very generous. That's an hour and a half a year that you're in front of the doctor. But to take care of a person, take care of your type 2 diabetes requires constant vigilance, constant efforts to try and manage your lifestyle, your food, your stress, your exercise, your weight, etc. And those are all things that can be enabled with technology. There are over a thousand apps today that are written for take, helping people with diabetes take care of their diabetes, for example. So one of the big issues that we face is if you put these three together, if we are successful at addressing the problem that has bedeviled our country since its founding, really, which is what do you do to take care of people or what do you provide in the way of support and income transfer in order to provide coverage for a population by saying that Medicare is a privilege or is a right, not a privilege. And obviously there are questions about how you can do that effectively. But let's say we do. Then the next big question is how do you solve the supply-demand gap? And technology, interestingly enough, and the use of technology to make, help physicians become more, more, uh, more productive, more effective, but also to provide many of the services that don't require physicians, in fact, don't even affect or uh, don't even require the medical care system those technologies are going to be crucial. 
And the last thing I'd say is, as you think about these issues going forward in your own career planning and so forth, there's an enormous challenge which both Ed and Lee hinted to, hinted at, and Kaiser Permanente has begun to address, I'm delighted to say, and that's this. That if you look at the factors that can change the disease burden and the likelihood of premature death, preventable premature death, medicine and what we do in medicine can probably handle or account for maybe 10 or 12 percent of the factors that influence those outcomes. What we do as docs, the technologies we have, the tools, medications, the, the diagnostic tools we have, influence maybe 10, 15 percent, let's say, max. The major determinants of health are zip codes. Zip code is destiny when it comes to health. If you take, are an African-American man living in the center of Washington, D.C., you are something like, predictably, going to die approximately 20 years earlier than a wealthy white executive sitting out in Montgomery County. Every mile you move from the center of Washington, D.C. towards Montgomery County, your life expectancy increases one and a half years. Why is that? It's because of income. It's because of education, availability of nutrition, availability of safe places to walk, public safety, safe guaranteed housing. These are the social determinants of health that actually have the most dramatic impact on the health outcome and health status of a population and have the greatest potential to lower the costs, the overall costs of health care. I would recommend a book. I mentioned it last year when I was here. It's called The American Healthcare Paradox. Uh, you might take a look at it. It's a very good uh, health policy analysis by two women, one at Yale, one at Harvard, which look at the fact that the United States spends, what, 18% of the GDP, roughly, on medical care, largely on medical care, compared to the next highest, which I think is Switzerland at about 12, 13%, something like that. And most of them are in the 9 to 10 range. In contrast, on social support services, the United States spends roughly half of what the other developed economies do. And yet the outcomes health status, preventable mortality, preventable deaths, preventable illnesses are much better in those other countries than ours. I was going to say, I think the 13th, the number 13 for cost drivers in the United States is that we spend too much on medical care. So let me finish with a quote from a friend who is a health care policy uh, observer and writer, Ian Morrison, a wonderful Scotsman. And um, he likes to say he, grew, he was born in Scotland, he grew up in Canada, and he lives in the United States. And he said, in Scotland, death is imminent. In Canada, it's inevitable. In the United States, we think it's optional. <laughs> Thank you very much. Which means we're between dinner. No. Yes, yeah, standing. We're standing 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 between. Standing. Yeah, that's not good. Questions. Yeah. We take your questions. Uh, we we initially talked about the fact that we would debate each other, but I think Ed suggested that that was a waste of time. It would be much more interesting to have your questions and see if we can respond and generate a dialogue that way. Sorry. 
Shoot. I got one. Oh, wait. There's one up there, George. Could you speak up so we can hear? Yeah, um, <laughs> we've all got hearing aids. <laughs> how do you think we can provide <laughs> more incentive for physicians to go into primary care, especially in high need areas? Go ahead. Oh. I, there are many ways to do it. The question was how do you provide more incentive for physicians to go into high need areas? And, no, that's and, correct. Going to primary, primary care, care in yeah. high need areas. Okay. Well, um, I would just uh, maybe say something controversial. I think high need areas need to grow their own in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. And the paradox is that uh, traditionally physicians have been trained uh, at medical schools, which is important. I think there's that's. It's going to be hard to change that, but there's one medical school now in the United States, AT Still, which is out of Arizona, which is a non-traditional medical school, where the students spend most of their time in community health centers from almost day one of medical school. And lo and behold, a lot of them are then moving into the primary care specialty. So that's, there's only one medical school in the country that does that. And there's lots of pros and cons to that. The second thing, grow your own, is that um, traditionally graduate medical education, so your internship and residency, which is funded by Medicare, Medicare, as Ed would say, <laughs> which is funded by Medicare, takes place in acute care hospitals. And young physicians don't learn about the opportunities in primary care and what a rewarding career in primary care can be like. And there is a fledgling program to address that in the United States called Teaching Health Centers, where um, there are about 700 doctors in training doing their internship and residencies based in community health centers around the country with the idea that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And yes, they also need hospitals to train in, so they need affiliated hospitals. But the funding stream had been yanked out of Medicare and put into other funding streams that would then end up making it more likely for them to actually look at full careers in community settings. So those are just two things off the cuff then. I want to say two conflicting ideas. One of my best friends was a practicing general internist in Healdsburg, California for 39 years. And uh, each time he talks about his patients, um, it makes me, it gives me tears in my eyes. He once wrote a paper for a small group of guys who meet once a month and write a paper, take turns writing a paper. He says, why I cry when my patients die. And I thought it was one of the most beautiful papers I'd, I'd heard because it talked about the humanness of being a primary care physician. That's its attraction. Basically what you're doing with 15, 20, 25 patients a day is reading 20 to 25 short stories, except they're real people. That's the beauty of it. The question is, given technology, and given what primary care physicians are doing today, whether or not a primary care physician is necessary. To be controversial, one can argue that even today, given the technologies available and the kinds of things that primary care physicians end up doing, about 90% of the routine work of a primary care physician can now be done by others or with technology. So the question becomes, what is the future of primary care in this emerging model where technology plays a critical role? And at the same time, recognize that to become a competent clinician is getting harder and harder and more challenging, even in the specialties. So there's a real question in my mind. Even though a lot of the rhetoric talks about medical homes and knowing your patients and giving them a home, your age, we know, values information more than relationships in many ways. You're transactional. You want to get your information as quickly and as in an unbiased way as possible. You want 24-7, 365 access like you can get on to almost any kind of information and solution you need. We can't do it with people. So there's a real question about the role of primary care going forward 
And I'm, I, would, I would agree with what Lee said in terms of the incentives, but I continue to be, to be skept, not skeptical, I don't want to be that negative about it, by asking myself questions. 20 years from now, is a primary care physician even going to need to exist? The answer to the question, that question is yes. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the technology will ena enable and ennoble primary care to do more things more efficiently, spend more time with patients, the better information. I mean, I, I, I think primary care, we, we had an experience, my primary care physician in Evanston quit, he was just burned out in his 50s. We had a Harvard medical graduate on Cape Cod, quit in his 50s, just the, the physician burnout. So, uh, the, so I, I, we now discovered a fellow in one of these quasi-concierge practices, and it's fantastic. The guy's able by phone, he, he calls a lab test in, he you get the results the next day. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. It's really good service and very good, uh, very, very good medical care. The short answer to the question is how you get more people to go into uh, to primary care. As a business school professor, as a realist, the answer is very simple. You pay them more. And until you do that, it's not going to work. You can, sit, you, can, you can do all the things you want, but ultimately, they won't work. You've got to pay them more equal to what other specialties are getting, and then you're going to see people go into them. People are economic determinants at some level. The, the I think, so there are questions too. So. Yeah, yeah, Jordan had a question. Yeah, go yeah ahead. Well, it's, it's on exactly mm -hmm. what you're talking about. Uh, let's assume the successful aggregation and distribution of fundamental healthcare information that becomes digitized and is up there in the cloud, available for distribution to anyone who wants to ask. You pointed out, and you did yesterday too, uh, people younger than us <laughs> are more interested in information and transaction than they are in having their hand held by a primary care doctor, to whom very few of them go now anyway. Um, um, talk about the intersection of technology that can be delivered by giant users of it, Amazon, Walmart, Google, Alphabet, uh, who have the system's power to deliver that type of information and how that may prospectively change, the, because we're talking population health here now more and more, how the access of populations to healthcare information, essentially through digitized distribution, will influence how care is delivered in the future. I think we often talk, uh, some of the books that have been written about uh, the role of technology overstate its impact, like Eric Topol's book, which is the patient, or the doctor, or the patient will see you now, that is sort of turning the conversion, conversation around, talking about all the things that technology can do that the doctor once did. I think we have to be very careful because what's happened in healthcare is that the expanse of things that medical that medicine has been asked to take on the medicalizing of social issues for example the the attempting to deal with the behavior change issues and the social issues that affect patients with asthma for example through the medical care system is not the highest and best use of the medical care system because we don't do it very well and it's extraordinarily expensive when we do it so the real issue is teasing apart what is uniquely done by a trained physician with the science that they have available for diagnosis and treatment, and what can be done in other ways. And you can't confuse the two. It's not going to be substituting one for the other, saying there's no more need for this kind of doctor. Primary care is right in the middle of that question, because so much of a primary care physician's role can be done in other ways, in a, with using other tools. Um, some people are going to need and will want to continue to have the kind of relationship Ed described. And I suspect what we'll have in 2050 is a mixed model with some primary care physicians taking care of patients who, who want that kind of service in hotspot medicine, for example, as we've seen in New Jersey or the kind of work that Lee is talking about. But much of many of the things that had been medicalized can be moved out of the medical care system where it gets done much better. 
And those are the opportunities for technology. Now, when you do that, you decrease demand for the medical care system, actually, and you move further upstream in finding illness. You find it earlier so that you can intervene earlier and you don't get the downstream <coughs> preventable complications of illness. I think it changes, the, has the opportunity to change the demand curve for medical care, which is the most expensive. It has the opportunity to change the cost curve in ways that tinkering the way, with the issues that Ed described don't do as effectively, at least not in my experience at Kaiser. But I also think it gives the doctors a far clearer role that, at least presently, there is no substitute for. Can I respond to that also? And uh, a few years ago, uh, in higher education, what are these, uh, these internet learning things, these MOS, what MOS courses, what are massive, what are yeah. online? Yeah. yeah, they're gonna make the professor obsolete, okay? I, I have no problem becoming obsolete, that's fine. <laughs> but uh, it hasn't quite happened that way. It hasn't happened that way. And I, I wanna strongly disagree with my beloved classmate, David, that there is, by the way, he was a quarterback of the football team. George was gracious to have talked about Rose Coxon, but David was quarterback, and you were fantastic. The team, which, like, you're 35 and four or something. We lost the last one at Williams when you were injured. Oh, yeah. It was terrible. We didn't wear helmets, so I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was uphill both ways in the yeah, snow yeah. barefoot. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Come on, come on. But I, I disagree. I think he turned down a professional baseball contract. I can believe it. That's right. The, now, the most important thing that I look for in a personal position, and I'm, but I think this is a generalizable statement, is the quality of the interpersonal relationship, the caring component. All the technology, David, you talk about will facilitate the ability of the primary care physician to be have longer than 10 minute visits, okay? <coughs> will be more interpersonally interactive. And I, I think that they will become even more important. I, I don't see any issue of them being uh, central to the healthcare system. Now that we've got a system going in Evanston uh, with a primary care for the family and then with a, ray, a spoke of, of specialists, it works well when they communicate. So I think these uh, um, uh, technologies become supplemental and additive uh, and, and increase efficiency, but they don't substitute for the basic interpersonal component. Yeah, so you talked about physician, uh, I mean, cultural competence, all that kind of stuff, being able to talk to language. So, student, and then we can get, yes, sir. So, uh, recently, in that it's, it's, it's been a new model of medicine to emerge. Uh, it's, it's very, like, rarely heard of. Uh, it's where local, like, s health systems are taking on responsibility of the insurance company and offering their own insurance to, to, um, whoever decides to take upon uh, that insurance, effectively eliminating the overhead that insurance companies typically would charge and then thereby reducing cost of health care. And I was curious to, to know if you guys see that as being more commonly adopted in, in the United States. The, the issue of risk bearing by health care delivery systems is a real it's a really interesting one. It, it, is a, it is a direction that's occurring. But the problem is that to become risk-bearing requires an enormous amount of expertise. And previous experiments in capitation, for example, where healthcare delivery systems went at risk, which is what you're talking about, didn't do very well in large measure because the physicians and the infrastructure wasn't there to manage the insurance financing component very effectively. That hasn't changed. Aetna did something very interesting starting several years ago, which is to start offering those kinds of support services to healthcare delivery systems so they could go more at risk. So they basically sold administrative services. We're seeing a fair a, a, a rise in that business model for insurance. But it's a really tough deal. It's hard enough for physicians to work together in a group. <laughs> What we always joke about is like we, you just saw between Eddie and me. What do you get when you get a physician when you put a physician in a closet by himself or herself? And the answer is an argument, <laughs> and, and, and it's it's very very true. We're trained to be independent. We're trained to be separate. So bringing coming together is hard, and then laying on top of that, going at risk is extremely difficult and risky financially unless you have a big enough pool. Jerry and the professor and the student, Jerry. 
<clears throat> so the question really is not theoretical for you, okay? Many of you are gonna be applying to medical school and the probability is that you're gonna be ending up with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. Absolutely. Okay? Yep. And, and what will determine what specialty you go into will not be the same as choosing what major you chose at Amherst College. Okay? You'll have that debt hanging over your head. And if you go into a specialty like infectious disease where they don't pay very much, okay, and others, you will not be able to pay off your debt. So you're going to decide on a purely economic basis. Yeah. Our daughter's a physician, and I prayed she wouldn't become a pediatrician. Oh, I prayed <laughs> for all of those reasons. I mean, it, it's, and that's another specialty where you need to increase the, uh, the, the reimbursement. Otherwise, you're not going to get the quality of people you need. You're absolutely right, Jay. Sir, the professor behind you. Just, yeah, yeah. Um, great presentation. Thank you. Great. Um, I just wanted to highlight that there are a number of organizations, student organizations at Amherst College right now that are putting a lot of emphasis on cultural competence, on cultural humility, um, on the need for the humaneness that you've been talking about in healthcare and medicine. And uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that this is happening right here on our campus. It's important. The second thing I wanted to say is that um, many of you know this, but there is going to be a community health center starting uh, this, this year in the town of Amherst. <coughs> uh, so I was really glad to see the map of Western Massachusetts that we had and emphasize that in our own community, we have major health needs and major health concerns and groups like the kidney uh, screening uh, group that get out and work with community connections see this and uh, uh, in future years, I think it will be important for our students to tune in to the fact that we have needs right here in our community. You don't have to go, you know, around the world to see it. It's right here. It's happening right here. Right here. The student behind and then back to Nikki. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is for Susan and Dr. Francis. It's about how, as a physician, do you sort of balance like the clinical aspects of your job and the more like community organizing aspects of working at a community health center and how did you build those skills like going to med school doesn't necessarily build the skills to be able to work with community and come with ideas to I don't know. <laughs> uh, the, the question was how sort of the balance between clinical and then the community, the sort of administrative community, public health. Well, from my own personal experience, I found that after, I, I, first of all, I, I looked for training opportunities that would put me in touch with uh, challenging populations, whether it was the State Medical School, the University of Illinois in Chicago, which did a good job of that. They basically said, here you go, and we'll see you in four years, kind of. And then in the public hospital, which was the county hospital, uh, public hospitals can provide that sort of sort of grist for the mill, the sort of the protoplasm that you need to put it in cellular terms to really kind of start thinking about these things. And then um, I feel that getting a lot of clinical experience within the first few years of after someone becomes a doctor, seeing a lot of patients, getting a lot of experience, hearing narratives, thinking of the narratives, before taking a jump to say, I want to run this or I want to do that. And slowly, it slowly starts to happen. In my own experience, uh, it was a good eight, seven, eight years before I said, okay, I've got a lot of experience now. I'm going to go back to school. I went back to public health school. Some students go to public health school before medical school or during medical school, and that's an option too. But there's a vernacular and a language you're either going to learn by experience, or by training, or both. And I, I can't say enough about experience, especially, you know, David mentioned that we live in an, an area where we want information now, we want to type it in a computer, we want to get the answer now. But um, experience is something that you, you can't graduate from Amherst and expect to be, you know, 
the CEO of a community health center. It's going to take a while, but you can definitely get there, and it's just how you set your ship in what direction. That's the fun thing about careers. There's so many ways you can go. I started an MD, MBA mm -hmm. program at Northwestern uh, in 86 because I wanted young men and women who would want to be a physician to understand, David, you were kind of one of my inspirations, uh, how the suits think. I mean, to learn the language of economics, learn the language of finance, so nobody could kind of bamboozle them. And we've been very successful in terms of our graduates going on to run organizations, et cetera. And also, I was teaching our executive master's program on weekends where people would come in in their 40s. And the number, the DRG of 1986, changing the way we paid, we had 30% of our classes were physicians coming back in to learn the uh, techniques of management. So there are many, many ways you can do it. And, and that's, again, about life. There would be a moment when you know, you went back to public health school, that now's the time to get the, the early learning. But the other thing I would recommend is reading widely. I mean, you mentioned Topol's book, which is so over the hill, it's terrible. But there are, ma there are many, many, uh, yeah, yeah. There are many other books about medicine, organizational behavior, economics. You mentioned a couple others. Read as much as you can. And, and for some of you, it'll come naturally. It'll come naturally. And uh, you'll do it. And then when you've read the books and you can cite them, people say, hmm, this person knows something. And avenues will open up. Avenues will open up. The other thing I would point out about that, it really builds on what both have said. It, it, when you finally get into a role of making decisions about a system, whether you're a, a clinic director or you're head of a system, it, the, the fascinating thing to me is trying to balance the ethical framework that comes with being a physician and the ethical framework that comes with taking care or having responsibility for a population. And those are two often overlapping, but not always overlapping issues. And unless you have sensitivity to what is involved with clinical decision making, you will err on the side of being too businessy. If you, if you are too businessy, then you're going to leave patients behind. You're not going to make the right kinds of decisions. However, the converse is always true, or also true. If you let physicians run the asylum without that balance, then you will make clinical decisions that actually bankrupt the system. Because the goal for doctors is to do everything for each patient, which can't be done. You have to organize it. You have to you have, to have a, a system for making decisions so that you're making evidence-based decisions and you're, you're, you're not rationing with each patient you see in front of you, but you're making decisions about how you're going to care for different populations. So that balance only comes through the kinds of experience that Lee and Ed are talking about. It, I, I, I discourage people from going too quickly out of medical school into business school or schools of public health. I agree with what Lee said about getting, really, it, it, it's not so much becoming a, 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 a um, grounded, a, a grounded as a specialist in clinical practice, but understanding the ethics and the way physicians have to make decisions in the, in, in the exam room is crucial to being able to make good decisions as a leader of a healthcare organization. I mean, I you I, I, more questions, guys. Can I just follow up 30 seconds or 20 seconds? Is it good? Just, you agree with me? Yeah, absolutely, on this one. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, <laughs> you're causing me to lose my train of thought. But anyway, <laughs> the, I found that I, I did three years of surgical training before the, going to school of public health, by the way, at Columbia. I use that clinical experience every single day as a professor of business. You every single day. You I mean, you, there's no substitute for having it, learning the hard stuff, and then you, you see the flaws, you see how it can be improved, and you go from there. You yep. go from there. Right. Okay. Like as Dean Aaron touched upon, the founding principle of KDSAT was to be a program for awareness to intervene in. Speak up if you would. The uh, final principle of Katie Sapp was to intervene whenever a uh, participant was found to be at risk of kidney disease or any kind of kidney illnesses. But one of the challenges I guess I found or my team found while I was co-president was once you identify somebody who was at risk and these participants were typically underserved and underserved populations, um, I guess is going to, first question is, is going to a community health center enough to address those, you know, those challenges that will come about with kidney disease, which is a um, very complex and very costly disease. And the second question was, how do you, 
how does how do we establish a system that instills the confidence in these people to go to these centers to know that they can take control of their own health care because we live in a system that almost tells you that if you don't have the money to do so then yeah, it's not worth it. I just wonder what you guys thought about that. Uh, so I assume that when patients people are screened for a disease Lo and behold, you find some people who have the disease, and some of them have it pretty bad, and they need not only what a primary care doctor could provide or what could be provided within the four walls of a community health center, they need a higher level of care. They need diagnostic testing, ultrasound. They need MRI scans. They need CT scans. They need a nephrologist. They need something that community health centers don't do. There, there is a movement to bring more specialty care into the community setting at community health centers, but it's a very slow movement and it may not be the right way to do things. I can say that um, one successful thing that we've done in Chicago is that when we think about putting a new site in a new neighborhood, Evanston, Waukegan, wherever it may be, the first thing we do is we go in there after we assess the community and see what the needs are of the community. Maybe it's high, high prevalence of diabetes. The first thing we go and figure out is who is going to be our hospital partner? Who is going to sign an affiliation agreement with us as a community health center that referrals are going to go back and forth regardless of the ability to pay? Because there's a quid pro quo here. Uh, I think that's Latin, right? Yeah. Quid pro quo. And that means you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, or some sort of thing like that. <laughs> and the way it works with hospitals is, you're gonna take our nephrology patient and put access in, they don't have insurance, and we're gonna figure out how to get them dialysis, let's just say, to put it in nephrology terms. And we're going to take pay paper, people from your emergency room who don't have a primary care home, and they're not going to keep showing up back in your hospital emergency room, costing you a million dollars, but you're going to spend that million dollars on charity care. And everyone's going to, they're going to spend the same amount of money, let's say, but everyone's going to be happier because there's a system to take care of people. We'll see your patients, you see ours, we'll all be happy. And Lo and behold, we've got nine partner hospitals in the Chicago area, and each is doing something, including the one that has the Northwestern name to it, which is separate from the university, but they're pulling their weight. And these are hospitals that traditionally didn't, but they're learning that if they do, it's better for their reputations, and it's better for health, and it's better for the community. Now, that's a Pollyannish view, and it doesn't work everywhere, but we're not going to put a health center where we don't have a, a willing hospital partner. And sometimes we have to teach them what it is that they have to do.